compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Didn't want heaven without us So Jesus, you right there where you're at, Father God, right now. We call on the name above all names, the name that delivers, the name that heals, the name that sets free, the name that overcomes, the name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. We call on the name of Jesus, that at that name, at that name, the name of Jesus, the demons tremble in fear because they know that all authority on earth, under earth, and all around the universe has been given to that name, the name of Jesus. So right now, 
we call upon that name. If you need something in your life from him today, would you just lift your hands right now all across this place? Lift your hands, not to me, not to the song, but to Jesus himself. And I run, want you right there where you're at. Just say, Jesus, you are the most powerful name I call on. The name above all names. There is no rival. There is no equal. You are the only one. So Jesus, we call upon you right now. Set free those who are captive, God. Bring deliverance to those. God, for those who overcome with anxiety and fear, God, we pray deliverance in the name of Jesus. For those struggling in addictions, God, we pray deliverance and we believe that, God, you can do the impossible. So right now, hands raised, hands raised to him and say, Jesus, you are the most powerful name I call on. I call on Jesus because there is no one greater than you. Can we do what a powerful name it is? Let's sing that again. What a powerful name it is. Come on, lift your voice. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against it. Nothing can stand against it. What a powerful name it is. we trust you we call on you we know all things are able are possible with you so God be with us I pray the next few moments of time as we learn about staying positive and being enthusiastic God help us to always remember is the name of Jesus that sets us free and brings us hope in Jesus name and everybody said amen amen you may be seated When your best friend wins the lottery, you tell him of generosity, and all you get is his old TV. It may not be HD, but stay positive. When you're off to get your morning brew, you want four creams, but she gives you two. Don't be mad, tip a buck or few. She may go to church with you. Stay positive. All right, if you have your programs, look on the back. We have notes that I want to follow along with me today. We're in the middle of our series called Stay Positive. And this series is all about the fact that we live in a very negative world. Uh, and so uh, what I want to do at the very first part of this year was set a mood, a temple, uh, uh, and a, a trajectory that we could start off with in 2023 that will help carry us through 2023. And so this series is all about different ways that we can stay positive. Our very first week, I talked about optimism, and I said that we're going to be optimistic. We're going to look on the outlook on life in a positive way, as positive as we can in a very negative or pessimistic world. And I said this statement the very first week, and it kind of set the tone. It doesn't matter how you feel. What matters is who God is. And so many times our emotions will trick us. They will play games with us. They will say things that are not true. But it does not matter what we feel. What matters is who God is and what God says. That's what matters. So our first week was, I'm optimistic. How do we get optimistic? We remember what God says and who God is. Uh, the second week, we talked about, I'm grateful. That in our world full of American mindset, we kind of take for granted the great things in the great world and the great country we live in because we're honestly a little bit spoiled to it. Uh, but that week was all about training our minds to be grateful in everything that we've been given. Being grateful to know that tomorrow we could lose it all, but it's not about the stuff. It's about the giver of the stuff. It's about God himself. Uh, then last week I talked about I'm an encouraged. I'm, a, I'm an encourager. I encourage people. Um, I hope you did my assignment I gave you this past week. Every day, texting, phone calling, uh, seeing someone, encouraging them, giving them a, a helpful word to build them up. Because let me tell you something. The world is out to tear every one of us down. A few great encouraging words can build someone up and bring hope to them and encouragement to them. And we as Christ followers should be the most encouraging people 
walking this planet. Anybody else believe me? You agree with me? Come on, some people. We should be the ones, the most encouraging, even in the most heart, most hurtful or hard places. We should be the ones that are lifting people up because the fact is the world is out to tear them down, out to speak negative and, 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 and destructive words. But if we're going to speak, we're going to speak life. We're going to speak hope into those that are around us. And so last week, I encouraged you to be an encourager. Uh, today, I'm going to talk with you about I'm enthusiastic. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm enthusiastic. Some of you believe that. Some of you actually are. Turn to someone else and say, I don't know if they are, but I know you're enthusiastic. There you go. Try that one. There's a story of a little boy who was very enthusiastic. He got one of his parents' old family Bible sitting on the coffee table. He loved the artwork. You guys all know what I'm talking about, those big coffee table Bibles that have the picture of Jesus on the front. He's knocking on a door or he's glowing or something like that. And you open it up, it's got all the great uh, uh, artwork inside. And this boy was so enthusiastic about the Bible. He's looking through it. He's reading it. He gets to Genesis. And and as, as he's starting to look through Genesis, all of a sudden the leaf falls out, a press leaf that had been inside the Bible. It falls out. And he's like, oh my gosh. He runs to his mom and says, mom, Look, look, I found it. And mom's like, well, what is it, son? It's Adam's first outfit. (laughs) Enthusiasm. Um, There are two kinds of people in this room and in this world. Two kinds of people. There are thermostats and there are thermometers. What does the thermometer do? A thermometer it merely interprets the environment in the room. Whether it's hot, goes up, cold, goes down. A thermometer is influenced by the other things going on in the room. But a thermostat does something entirely different. The thermostat controls the environment in the room. If, the therm- if you want it hot, you turn the thermostat up. You want it cold, you turn it down, or vice versa. I don't really, I always get confused on that. You know what I'm talking about. You can change the environment by adjusting the thermostat, and that's the way it is in our lives today. Some of you in this room today, your thermometers, you merely adjust to the environment of the enthusiasm of the room. Others of you are thermostats, and you set the tone, and you set the environment, and you set the place on fire. See, two kinds of people, people who have influence and people who are influenced by influencers. I don't know which one you are. You may be one, you may be a thermometer, you may be a thermostat, but it's kind of like this. Enthusiasm is all relative according to the person that is either receiving the enthusiasm from the room or radiating the enthusiasm from themselves. Uh, in our town, of course, Walmart is, a, is the shopping store that everybody goes to. And if you've ever been to Walmart, uh, I'm sure you have, you know there's two kinds of people. There's thermometers and there's thermostats, uh, as far as employees go. Uh, you have those thermometers who they hate their life, man. I mean, it is the worst day of their life. They had to come to work today. They had to wait on you. You ask for something, they grumble and complain. Ah, I get it for you. They're thermometers. They're just grumpy because everybody's grumpy. And then you have these radiant little thermostats of just joy that you go, where did they get you? Did you come on a truck or something? Are you shipped in? Where's... It's a different kinds of person. Thermostat versus thermometer. Enthusiasm can be contagious. In fact, enthusiasm is very contagious, and whether you're a thermometer or a thermostat, you determine how it functions. Let me tell you what enthusiasm defined as in the Greek, okay? In the Greek, enthusiasm is en theos. En theos, en theos, right there. And it means to be in God or filled with God. So see, when I talk about enthusiasm, many of you are going, well, I'm not a real excitable person. I'm not like him up there on the platform. I'm not like her over there. I'm not, 
that has, enthusiasm has nothing to do with this energy. It has everything to do with the fact that we're in God, filled with his presence. Enthusiasm is not just the mood you're in. It's a result of the intimate relationship you have with the creator. Enthusiasm. In fact, here's what Paul said. If you have your Bibles, open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 and 58. He says, uh, but thank God, uh, but thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. It goes on to say in 58, it says, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong in what? Immovable, always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless, or other translations say, in vain. Bow your heads with me today. Father God, help us today to discover what it truly means to be enthusiastic in you, filled with your presence, filled with you, God. And may we become, instead of thermometers, thermostats that influence others around us with the same enthusiasm you give us. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, um, enthusiasm in, in, a, in a very physical, non-spiritual sense is this. When the kids were little and Michelle would go out of town, and I was responsible for the kids, for Tyler and Lily, for any period of time, the housework and the dishes and all that did not happen. The beds were unmade, the, the, the clothing was stacked up, the, the dishes were piled into the, into the sink. Nothing was done until one hour to tick down, Michelle was coming home. And then we all became very enthusiastic to get it all done. There was a motivator there. Michelle was coming home. No matter what we do, we need to do things with enthusiasm. Here's what Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says. It says this. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Work with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Now, this is going to be a message that's going to speak to many of you today because some of you have not been real enthusiastic about your jobs, about your bosses, about your employers. Water cooler talk, you talk bad about them, you tear them down, you, you, you think they're, no, oh, this is fake, you think they're idiots, okay, let's just call it what they are. They're dum-dums, you know, they don't know what they're doing, right? Uh, and so this is a scripture that I hope will speak to us that when we work, we're supposed to work as if we're in God, filled with God's presence, no matter what we do. Mowing the lawn, can't stand mowing the lawn, I want to kill it and spray paint it green, right? It's, I don't like it, but do it as under the Lord. Waiting on tables. Uh, stay at home mom, stay at home dad, if that's who you are. You do it with enthusiasm. You do it as unto the Lord. Whether you're a CEO of a company or at the bottom lowest part of the run, it does not matter. Do it as unto the Lord. Walking on a factory line, uh, you're doing it as unto the Lord. Uh, serving here at church, serving your neighbors, serving anyone around you, do it as unto the Lord, as if his spirit is in you and you're working not in your own strength, but in something supernatural that pushes you to do it well. See, enthusiasm, I'm gonna remember this, enthusiasm is not necessarily just about the product of what you do, it's the posture of our hearts. Enthusiasm is really the posture of our hearts that we're humble, that we're loving, that we're kind, that we serve, and we think of others better than ourselves. It's the posture of our hearts. It's the secret sauce to living a Christian life. It's what Jesus did on the cross. The posture of his heart, he could have called all authorities down and stopped at any point the brutality of the cross. But in his enthusiasm to be filled with God's presence and do what God called him to do, he postured his heart, humbled himself, and he followed all the way to death of dying on the cross. The posture of our heart is so imperative to be enthusiastic. Paul, 
Many times in his life, he was struggling. He was in chains. He was beaten. He was uh, chained up for the gospel. He was under house arrest. Uh, Many times, Paul had all these horrible things come against him, but the posture of his heart helped him to remember he was enthusiastic to present the gospel to everyone that he had a chance to. Now, a character we're going to look at the rest of our time today, just kind of following through this enthusiasm, is the young man named David. Uh, you may know him as King David. Uh, David was, uh, what is a huge Bible character throughout our Old Testament, sets a lot of bars for all of our lives. And David had a spiritual enthusiasm about him. David had this thing inside of him where he just desired to do what God wanted him to do. David was enthusiastic as a boy, and as he became king, he became more complacent in his walk with God. He lost some enthusiasm the older he got. Where do we see it happen? Well, first off, uh, David is known for his great battle with Goliath, David and Goliath. How many of you guys ever heard that story? Anybody ever heard that story? All right, good. I don't have to go over it. David and Goliath, we see that uh, here's Dave, uh, this Philistine Goliath is mocking the, uh, the Israelite children and telling them they're no good and they're, they're dogs and they're, they're worthless and everything like that. And David shows up to a field one day. He hears it and something inside him becomes enthusiastic and he feels like he has to do something about it. He's not going to stand for what this Philistine, this uncircumcised Philistine is saying. In fact, open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45, 46. We won't go into full details, but here's kind of a summary. It says, uh, David said to the Philistine, to Goliath, you come against me with sword and spear and a javelin, but I have come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This little guy, David, up against this giant Goliath, this little guy, David, who is not prepared for battle or war at all, and yet he's going against a mighty, mighty warrior. It says this, verse 46, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give your carcasses Uh, your carcass of the Philistine army and the birds of the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Now, that is enthusiastic. That's enthusiasm at its finest. I mean, this little guy is just running his mouth, not in his own confidence, not in his own, but in God, in in Thales, Filled with God, he runs out and he spouts off and he lets the giant know, your day is done. God's had enough and I'm going to put a stop to it. How did David do this? Where did this come from in David's life? Three things, write these down in your notes. Three things, three ways that David got this enthusiasm to start and run on a field with a giant and believe that God could do it. Here's number one. Number one. David trusted God. He trusted God. He trusted that God could do the impossible. Here's how he knew that God could do it, because one day he was watching his sheep and a lion came up and he killed a lion. Another day he's watching sheep and a bear comes up and he killed the bear. David was shown over and over again the, the enthusiasm, the trust God has me. He trusted God no matter what. He trusted God daily. Second thing is, he walked with God daily. He walked with God daily. Not only did he trust God, but in the fields, I'm sure there were many times, and we read throughout the psalm which David wrote, throughout the psalm, David writes about this trust, this enthusiasm he has in God. Psalm 23 Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For why? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They guide me. They lead me. I trust you, and I walk with you every day, God. I'm with you no matter what. He trusted God. He walked with God. And the third one is he worshiped God daily. He didn't wait till Sunday at 10 o'clock, Sunday morning, till 1020. That's our worship times. No, no. He worshiped God daily. He played his harp. He sang. 
He walked with God, he wor- trusted God, and he worshiped God daily. Uh, David was so into the worship of God that fast forward as he is king now, uh, the Ark of the Covenant had been taken away, and they're finally bringing it back home, bringing it back home to be in the temple. And when the Ark comes in, David strips down to nothing, baby, but his birthday suit, and he goes to dancing and worshiping right in the streets. Now, that is a worshiper. Now, no one in here is allowed to do that. We draw the line at that. Keep your clothes on, please. Jesus sees it all, and he doesn't need to see any. We don't need to see any of that. He was never afraid to worship God Almighty. He was never afraid to show his enthusiasm for worshiping the God who does the impossible. Some of you sitting here today... Uh, you're real enthusiastic in some areas and not so much in others. Some of you are real enthusiastic when it comes to sports. I've seen you. I've watched you. You go crazy. You're out of your mind crazy. When your team wins, you think you've won. You're the winner. They did it because you didn't change your underwear, right? That's why. And then you got, when they lose, it's you... It's so funny. When they win, we think we had something to do with it. But when they lose, it was all their fault. Think about that, right? So true. Real enthusiasm. And here's the thing. David, how he was able to walk on that field with such confidence and such enthusiasm was because he wasn't walking in himself. He was walking filled with God. He trusted God. He walked with God daily, and he worshiped God daily. And see, this spiritual, this spiritual um, enthusiasm comes out in all of our lives. If we walk with God daily, we trust God daily, we say a prayer and something happens in a miraculous way, and we know that's God. Uh, we, we ask God for something, or we seek God for something, and he unfolds it and makes it happen. We worship in this place. We worship in our home. We worship in our car. We worship in our school. We worship God everywhere we go because why? We're walking with God. We are enthusiastically, we are filled with the Spirit of God. This is young King, da- young David, young kid David, and what he was in his life. See, there are two different kinds of David in the Bible. We have the kid David and we have the King David. The kid David is the one we just read about, running into battle, facing his giants, and trusting that God was going to take his giants down. And then later on, and so in 1 Samuel 17, we read about this, this shepherd boy coming to the field and doing this amazing thing, and his name is now renowned in all of Israel because of what he did in 1 Samuel 17. Fast forward in 2 Samuel 11, and here's what it says. So again... Kid David running on a battlefield to fight his battles, to fight for God. Fast forward, King David, here he is. It says, in the spring, the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab to go with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. So here's Kid David running off into battle and fighting the the, the giants that was against him. But King David sat in his palace in luxury and never lifted a finger to be enthusiastic for God. And this is the challenge in all of our lives. When we're young and when we're little and when we're new to Christianity, we come into Christ, we have this excitement, we have this enthusiasm. We're so excited, we tell everybody about who he is. Man, we're we're not ashamed. We're not ashamed because why? We've been changed, we've been saved, we've been given this hope of eternity. And so we're enthusiastically passionate about who our God is because he's done so much for us. But then as time moves on, our enthusiasm tempers, our enthusiasm settles down, and we become more complacent and more comfortable in our walk with God. As a kid, David was filled with this enthusiasm to serve the Lord. But as a king, he becomes apathetic and comfortable in where he lives. I would argue, I would argue that is because David 
When he was a child and when he was a kid marching on that field to fight Goliath, he knew the only way he was going to defeat the, the, the giant was to have God on his side. But yet as a king, and he had accomplished all these great things, now he believed he was the authority to maintain his power. Which one represents you today? All of us. Think about this. Think about it in your own personal life. Think about whenever you are, you are first a Christ follower and how there was this light about you that just glowed everywhere you went. People even said, wow, something's different about you. What's going on? They even saw this light that lit up inside your life. You weren't shaken by culture. Whenever, uh, whenever people started talking about things that were immoral or things that were wrong, you exited the communication. You exited the, the process because you knew that that wasn't right. You felt something inside of you say, whoa, run. That's the Spirit of God in you. God filled in you. And you would get away from it whenever the dirty uh, jokes came up. And uh, whenever people would be cussing, you never really preached at them, but you were like, yeah, I don't want to talk like that. I don't want to act like that. I don't want to be like that. You didn't let a word come out of your mouth. You prayed in faith and things happened like you never saw before. You you worked your job like you were doing it for Jesus and not for the boss. You served your family like you were doing it for Jesus and not because you, they were just your family. You served them like Christ serves the church. Your enthusiasm radiated from your very most inner being because you were in God, filled with his presence. Or we become comfortable we become complacent. We grumble about serving, grumble about our jobs, and grumble about life. We're quiet in our faith. When the world is speaking against God and speaking against what, what, uh, what we believe, we quiet and we don't say a word. We don't say a peep. We don't cause any problems. You, you come to church and you're very sophisticated and very conformed. Uh, maybe today you, you act a certain way on Sunday and then come Monday through the rest of the week you're somebody else. Uh, maybe today uh, it is because you are uh, raising kids. You can't wait to raise them. You feel tired. You feel weary. You feel discouraged. I'm here to tell you, you need the entheos to be filled with God's presence, enthusiasm poured back on you. You need his presence to come and fill you and encourage you. Uh, tragically, the accurate picture in our world today and in our church today is that we have a lot of people that are good people, good-hearted people, but they have lost the enthusiasm for the Spirit of God and for walking with the Spirit of God. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, it says, uh, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent. And do the things that you did at the first. Revelations is speaking here about the church that lost its first love, the church that had grown lukewarm. People who allowed the enthusiasm to drain out of them and they were just surviving, just getting by, not really passionate for what God wanted to do inside their life. And this is the challenge that I want to give you today. When I say the words, I'm enthusiastic, it's not about this. It's not about this energy that I'm putting out. It is about the filled with the Spirit of God to go and make an influence and become thermostats in your world. Not to be thermometers, not to conform to the world. Because let me tell you something, guys. The world is doing everything they can to shut you up. They don't want to hear the voice of truth. Not, and when I say the voice of truth, I'm not saying that you're the voice of truth. I'm saying his word is the voice of truth that does not compromise. I don't care how much you want to try to justify it or how much you want to take and twist scripture the way it is. This is what God's word says. And that enthusiasm that comes only comes from a heart that's trusted God, walked with God, and worshiped God every single day. And some of you, that's where you have to begin. 
You have to trust God. Trust God. Some of you, you, you say you trust God, but you don't really because you still hold on to it. I trust God to bring me along a, a suitable helpmate, a, a spouse or a future husband or a wife, but you're holding on to the one that's not worth having. You don't really trust God. You say you do, but you want God to change that person instead of God, trusting God to release that person and let God bring the right person along in your life. I don't know who that's for today, but that's from God. Trusting God rather than just verbally, but allowing things to be let go. Walking with God. Walking with God every day you wake up. God, you're here. God, you're with me. Worshiping God in your car, in your workplace. Man, you're on a factory line. If you're on a factory line, man, I know it can be kind of like mundane, kind of like mindless things, but while you're doing it, worship God the whole time. Connecting with him, trusting him. Kid David was enthusiastic. King David was complacent. Two types of people in this room right now. Thermometers and thermostats. God's not looking for thermometers. God's looking for thermostats. God doesn't want you just to conform to the environment around you and just, just give in to whatever the, whatever the wind blows and whatever, whatever trend is coming in, whatever culture says. God's not looking for that. God does not want that. That is, the, that is the lukewarm. That is the ones that he says, I want you not to be lukewarm, but be hot or cold. Be a thermostat. Be one or the other. He's looking for all of us to step up our commitment to him, to trust him, to walk with him, to worship him every single day, and to find ourselves at a place where we are influencers of our community. You're influencers in your home with your kids. You're influencers in your workplace. You're influencers in your school. You're passionate about God and you because you have him in you. Listen. You're influencers. You're passionate about everything you do, even though you don't like your job. Don't do your job for the boss, for the master. Do it for Jesus Christ. Serve him. Be filled with his presence, enthusiastically walking with him every day because enthusiasm is not a product of how you feel. It's the posture of your heart, knowing who God is. Enthusiasm is, is not something we work up to. It's something that's born out of an intimacy with God. Enthusiasm, entheos, filled with God. Father God, help us today. Help us today to be entheos, filled with your presence. God, if we're being real today, I don't think anyone in this room can say that we're 100% enthusiastic in life. Life's hard. There's struggles, there's fears, there's anxieties, there's, there's uh, challenges to overcome. And Lord, every time we face something, every time we come against something, it, it, it's like the breath is taken from us. It's like uh, we lose a little bit of, 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 of wind in our sail, God. We, we lose enthusiasm, and God, as time goes on, as time goes on, as time goes on, we become more and more and more complacent. But God, I pray today that as this message has spoke, that God, we would become enthusiastic. We don't have to feel it, God. It's a posture of our hearts. that, God, we would ask you every day to walk with us, that we would trust you, that we would worship you, God, in everything we do. With head bowed and eyes closed today, as I was preaching, as I was talking today, some of you are, are sitting there and you say, yes, that's what I'm missing, that's what I'm missing. I'm missing that enthusiasm. I'm missing that passion. I'm missing that, that drive, that, that, that spirit of God propelling me to great things, to stand for him, to, 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 to hold the line when the culture pushes back. I'm called to be a thermostat because honestly, I've been a thermometer for far too long. 
It's time for me to pray and ask God, make me a thermostat to be an influence of my culture. If that's you with your head bowed, eyes closed, I want you just right here, right now, say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for being influenced by the world. Forgive me for allowing them to dictate my enthusiasm. I now ask you, God, help me. Help me this week. Help me starting today. Help me to shift to be a thermostat, to be a thermostat, to change my friends, to change my family, to let them see Jesus in me and through me, working through me, through the light of Jesus Christ. Let me be changed from the inside out, God. Start with us. Start with us, God. Start with us. Being enthusiastic for you, filled with your presence, filled with your spirit, God, to go and do amazing things for your kingdom. God, we need your enthusiasm right here, right now. So we bring it to you, we bring our lives to you. We ask you, God, to fill us with your spirit.
Father God, help us today as we leave this place to be enthusiastic in you, filled with you, filled with your presence. God, may we trust you daily, walk with you daily, worship you daily, God. Everywhere we go, may people know that the radiance of God lives inside of us and reverberates out. God, in our workplace, in our schools, in our community, wherever it is we're serving, wherever it is we're working, do it as unto you, God, with enthusiasm in our hearts. Now go with us and let us this week be enthusiastic in all we do. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here. Be enthusiastic. We'll see you next Sunday.